I'll ask my panelists to please turn on your videos. All right, great, there we are. Um, a very good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those who are in Kenya and the region. Um, welcome to today's Doing Business with the United States, East Africa, Apparel, and PPE webinar. I am your moderator for today. My name is Max Lokelo. I'm the Chief Executive of the American Chamber of Commerce here in Kenya. <clears throat> An independent um, business services organization that has a mandate to facilitate and nurture two-way trade and investment between Kenya and the US. We are pleased that you could join us for this first session in a two-part series of webinars organized by the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub, East Africa Buying Activity. The Trade Hub has been a long-term partner of Amcham, and we are honored to be supporting these two very important webinars. Now, I want to begin off by giving you a synopsis of how today will look like. Um, so in terms of the agenda, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, this is how we're going to, or this is what you can look forward to today. We have a series of presentations, four to be precise, um, and, and an opening uh, presentation that will be delivered by Margaret Waithaka, whom I'll be introducing shortly. Um, after which, we will have a Q&A session that I will moderate, and it will give you an opportunity to engage with the presenters and the speakers. And so today we have a really, really great cast um, of speakers lined up and ready to engage you. For now, I'll briefly mention who they are, and we'll introduce them properly when we get to the presentations. So we have with us today, I'll start off with the ladies first. We have uh, Margaret Waidaka who's the program director, East Africa, USAID, Southern, Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub. Maybe Margaret, you can just quickly wave to the audience. Thank you. We also have with us Michelle Steenvodi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> uh, Michelle, great. Michelle is the vice president, uh, professional services for GABA Technologies. We also have with us Andres Saldias, um, Andres, you wanna just wave? Yeah, there you go. Andres is an, an apparel market linkage consultant with, uh, for East Africa, um, for the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub. We also have with us Avedis Sefarian, who is the president and CEO World, of, of the Worldwide Responsible Accredited Production WAP. And finally, um, and certainly not last, um, and least, <laughs> my friend Roger Bard, Chief of Party of USAID's Kenya Investment Mechanism. So before we begin, um, just a few housekeeping announcements. Um, this session is being recorded, and this is purely for internal purposes, internal review purposes, so we wanted to make you aware of that. Secondly, you realize that you've joined with your audio and video um, muted or off. This will stay the same for the duration of the presentations and will give you an opportunity to engage during the Q&A. Now, I want to urge you that as we progress with the presentations, feel free to type in your questions. At any point, type in your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. That would be the Q&A tab and not the chat tab, the Q&A tab, so that it's easier for us to monitor the questions as they come in. As I said, we may at some point call on some of you to field your questions directly to the panelists. Um, and when we do that, please remember to unmute your mic. And if you're brave enough, feel free to turn on your, your video. And so, without much further ado, I want to get this show on the road. Um, I want to invite our host, Margaret Waidaka, to take the stage, set the scene for us, and uh, formally introduce the session. And as Margaret is preparing, I just want to share a few words a little about Margaret. Margaret is a pro program director, East Africa, USAID, Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub. She is an economic development specialist 
who has been involved in trade and investment promotion in various African countries for most of her 38 year career, working with UNDP South Africa, the Export Processing Zone Authority in Kenya, and the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Margaret, over to you. Thank you, Maxwell, and good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to the people in the US. Thank you very much, all of you, for making time to come uh, to share with us and to listen to the presentations and the discussions that will go on today. Let me just uh, reiterate, this is one of a two-part series. We have a similar event on Friday, the 25th of September, same time, and hopefully the same place, and you're very welcome to that. Uh, also, welcome to the panelists and also the team from AmCham, along with my colleagues from the USA Trade Hub and the bigger uh, USAID community. Um, the objective of our two, uh, thank you. The objective of our two day webinar is as follows. Um, first of all, it's to provide information about us, about the USA Trade Hub and specifically the East Africa activity. Secondly, we'd like to provide information on developments in the apparel and PPE sector. Uh, thirdly, we want to link your enterprises to sources of capital and technology, and you'll find that the program will address some of those issues. Third, fourthly, we'd like to share learning amongst the participants. And fifthly, very nice, we'd like to be able to network, even if virtually. Great. What is the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub? You're probably wondering, we're here in East Africa, and we're talking about Southern Africa. So if you all recall, we used to have three uh, regional trade hubs. There was one in East Africa, there was one in West Africa, and there was one in Southern Africa. Um, we are working under the Southern Africa Trade Hub, which is a five-year trade and investment program uh, of, of USAID. Its purpose is to increase competitiveness, intra-regional uh, trade, and improve food security in Southern Africa. And in so doing, it creates uh, sustainable economic growth, it helps to increase global export competitiveness in the countries that it works in, and finally, gr grows trade in targeted Southern African countries. Um, the hub also uh, under Goa, and also boosts capital and technology flows into Southern Africa, providing uh, targeted trade facilitation support. Great. Now, why East Africa? Well, we are based in East Africa, as obviously you can see, and the participants are, are, are from East Africa. So USAID uh, uh, established a, an activity under the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub, but catering to East Africa. Its purpose is to promote economic activity between the US, obviously, and the five East African countries, which are Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. And these are the countries I hope will be represented here today, both in terms of the discussion and also in terms of the audience. This is a very short activity, it's only 18 months, but despite being short, it's expected to boost two-way trade and investment between the US and East Africa, and specifically work, under the, work out the US government's Prosper Africa initiative. Our focus will be on, first of all, expanding exports to the US and Goa. That will be discussed to some extent today under the apparel sector. Secondly, we are supporting exports of technology from the US to East Africa. And lastly, but not least, we're also facilitating reduction in trade barriers uh, within East Africa. Next. So what activities are we, will we be undertaking in those 18 months? Uh, first of all, we are conducting end market research for the targeted uh, products. Secondly, we'll be coaching enterprises on engaging with the US market. That's currently ongoing, particularly for the apparel factories that we have uh, engaged with and mapped. Thirdly, we'll be linking to uh, the US markets, US capital and US technology. So we'll be linking the enterprises from East Africa to those particular aspects of the US business. Fourthly, we'll be linking East African and US private sector associations. And last but not least, we'll be supporting regional trade policy analysis and review. What sectors do we work in? Apparel and personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, specialty foods, including coffees and teas, footwear or shoes, home decor and fashion accessories. In the old days, we used to call them handicrafts, 
and last but not least, essential and natural oils, which are very relevant in today's uh, post-pandemic pandemic world. Uh, today's subject matter is uh, apparel. And uh, as you all know, apparel consists of the largest non-oil commodity sold from our region to the US and our Goa. Uh, the graph that you can see shows the trend country by country. So on the left, we have Ethiopia. And this covers uh, four years, just to be clear, four calendar years, 2016 to 2019. Um, Ethiopia grew from a low of 32 million up to 207 million last year, which is a very high growth rate. Kenya is the largest producer, uh, exporter, uh, growing from 339 million to 452 last year. And Tanzania has also grown steadily from 36 million to 51 million, with Uganda and Rwanda participating in smaller quantities. You can see the total on the far right shows the sum of AGO exports of apparel to the US over the last four years. That's from 2016 to 2019. And what you can see, it's been a very positive growth trend. Thank you. Next slide. So uh, I would like to urge all of us as we engage today uh, to be uh, very uh, keen on noting some of the information that will be provided uh, by the speakers, the re respective speakers. But if you don't get everything you, you need today, you feel free to get in touch with us through the Trade Hub staff, myself, uh, Margaret, and then we also have Naima, who is our, pro our program officer based in Nairobi, and we've given you below our email addresses. And since I won't have an opportunity to say so at the end, I would like to thank very, very much everybody who's been involved in this activity and urge you to make the maximum possible use of this chance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret, um, for setting the stage for us. And uh, I want us to move quickly. Um, I want to invite Andres Aldias to take the stage. Um, and Andres will be speaking to us about US market changes and trends for the apparel and PPE. Um, as Andres is setting up, I just want to share a few, a little bit of a background um, on Andres. Andres is currently the apparel market linkage consultant East Africa, as I said, for the USA South and Africa Trade and Investment Hub. He's an accomplished and vastly is accomplished and vastly experienced in the apparel sector with 25 years of experience negotiating and managing apparel global sourcing contracts with international buyers. He's a former exporter and business owner in a 5,000 worker textile and apparel industry in Bolivia and Peru. He's worked on internal internalization strategies design and implementation for over 400 MI SMEs apparel exporting farms in 35 countries, including Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia, and conducted assessment visits and provided technical assistance to 89 enterprises in the textile and garment sector in six countries in East Africa. He has also advised governments and other institutions and is widely published on this topic. So without much further ado, welcome, Andres, over to you. Thank you so much, Maxwell, for the introduction. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing today how does the U.S. market uh, looks like at current conditions. As you know, we are living in an unprecedented scenario, and we're going to bring up to speed all this information as the startup of, of this uh, seminar uh, of doing business with the U.S. As you can see, uh, during the first four months of this uh, year, uh, the, uh, the retail sales dramatically in the U.S. market. Uh, in May, 63% uh, dropped down, while in April was 87% in the U.S. market. Uh, actually, all markets around the world have dropped down their sales locally, uh, but the, the U.S. had a dramatic uh, slowdown in their sales. That led to, to a new uh, trend, which is the online, as you can see in in. May and June, the online has grown rapidly. Uh, a lot of uh, new players offering low cost, fast fashion, and a one to two week cycle to get to the customer as quickly as possible. Uh, this is expected to continue to see um, the restructuring of the uh, of these retail sales, uh, and some uh, physical stores may be continue closing down uh, because of this digital presence. Uh, there are uh, online focus operators. Um, moving to reduce inventory and often new short supply 
uh, just to respond quickly to the demand. Uh, this scenario has created a lot of opportunities and challenges, not also for the retail industry, but also for the uh, global supply chain in the apparel industry. Uh, uh, the U.S. imports have fallen dramatically uh, as well uh, in, the, in the last four months for, through April. It was 19%, and just in April was a dramatic 42% decrease in, in the imports. And as you can see, the major uh, in, uh, countries that are supplying the U.S. that, are, that, that have uh, received this impact, of course, is China, but also Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Indonesia, and India. Uh, this is the same trend in Europe, as you can see from the chart. Uh, this is, of course, due to the pandemic. Um, as far as of PPE, I want to point out that regardless of all this pandemic, China is still being the king of the PPE. They supply 160 million masks a day, which is 12 times more than prior to the outbreak. China is supplying 48% of the PPE to the US market and 50% of the European Union. Um, nevertheless, according to the, um, the, the Chinese export, it just dropped down 15% in the last two months. But you can see that China PP stirs huge against uh, the imports from the uh, rest of the world. Um, that shows as well that, uh, that the PP uh, went less reduction against other products. That means that even though the pandemic uh, hit 28% uh, of uh, imports from, from other products or, uh, from China, uh, the PP only dropped down 17%. That's basically because of the closures of the factories during the pandemic, but then it started to recover once the economy in China was open. Uh, therefore, uh, a big play on PP still be in China, uh, which at the same time represents an, an interesting opportunity to replace those, as I will explain further. Um, this has created several issues in the industry. Uh, 40 million unemployed in the U.S. created, of course, lower demand at the retail sector, uh, cash flow problems, uh, high inventory problems in, in the companies that created a lot of bankruptcy. 44 retailers have already landed in bankruptcy in 2020. J. Crew, Nima Marcos, Brooke Brothers, and J.C. Pini just filed bankruptcy uh, in May. Uh, and industry executives and analysts say, uh, are forecasting that if there's a second wave of infections of COVID-19, there will continue some liquidations of companies. Um, it's important to understand that importing the PP products into the U.S. is not just a regular apparel because it's not considered apparel. Actually, it's considered as per the FDA as a medical device. Therefore, uh, they have special regulations they have issued an emergency use authorization due to the pandemia, pandemia to allow certain products uh, to be um, used in, in health care settings. Mm -hmm. There is a bunch of regulations that are in place uh, that will be just an entire seminar to, to, to better explain. But you can see all of them in that the link in the website from, from the, the, the CPB, uh, Border and Patrol, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, and these also have created Imports transforming production activities into into this segment of the market. Um, major brand selling already, even though there's a lot of fragmented companies in the market, a lot of small and medium-sized players all over the U.S. Uh, the major players still importing the largest portion, like a uh, Honeywell, Ansel, Dupont, uh, Alpha, Protect, Johnson. Uh, this has created an opportunity for the local industry. And that's one of the impacts that happen. Uh, local industry manufacturing service in the U.S. are, are coming strong. Uh, this is because it became a very important industry almost overnight. The industry largest operator are at maximum capacity and they're expanding domestic production. Hello, Andres. Did we lose him? Hello, Eva, can you hear me? 
<clears throat> yes? Seems like we lost Anders. I believe so. Okay. Just give him a second and see if we can join back. Hello, can you, see, can you hear me? Yeah, Anders, welcome back. Uh, we lost you there. So if you could please just share your screen again and pick up from the top of uh, that particular slide you're on. All right, you, I'm, I'm back, right? So basically, moreover, the expected continuation in demand for masks and related PPE is, is continued to sustain the industry in many countries that are starting to supply these products to, to the market. So we're talking about a $6, million, $6 billion dollar, uh, industry, over 200 companies, and over 11,000 uh, working positions uh, in, in this uh, segment of the economy. It's important also to understand what does it take to provide the U.S. government? They, they do acquire this product, uh, and it's a large uh, um, trading at this point because it's supplying for, for health uh, care issues during the pandemic, but, but they have to be part of the TAA designated country. Uh, some of uh, East African are designated, like Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda. Nevertheless, uh, others are not, like Kenya, but there is uh, some exceptions uh, non-TA compliant. The one we have as today is that uh, Kenya could be awarded until September 30. We don't know what's going to happen after that, but this is part of the of the massive regulations that are uh, this this industry. Um, well, what does resilience look like? You know, we show the the, the the bad part. So, how does this new global scenario looks like? And industry leaders are now talking about the resilience of the sector. Uh, let me share some of these industry leaders' visions. I was able to gather from about, I would say, eighty to a hundred leaders. Uh, how do they look uh, to face these challenges? Uh, number one problem is liquidity. Okay, uh, this is a, a main factor to recovery. Uh, they're talking about moving mechanisms like 20, 25 years ago. Uh, uh, LCs are coming back, uh, like at like that time, uh, with credit prices, of course. Uh, insure, backstop insurance credit also is going to be in place. Uh, so industry is looking solutions to solve these cash uh, flow problems. As mentioned, e-commerce e is, is in trend. Speed to market is one of the is is the top word in right now, and technology to communicate with the clients and the factories to reach those uh, segment of, of of the consumers in a in a fast and accurate manner to ensure there's no mistakes that they, they reach the, the the house of the consumers in in one two three day max. Labor conditions and human are of course of the concern, even though the industry has shared that they, uh, uh, they did all they could not to cancel orders during the pandemic, but moreover to, to encourage safety regulation like mask and protection. But moreover, the corporate social responsibility is, is the highest risk starting in, in the cotton crops. If they don't take care of this CSR from the producer of, of, of cotton, uh, then it's going to be a, a, a high impact in the industry in the long term. So industry leaders are, are really taking seriously the CSR uh, starting in the entire value chain. Uh, transparency is the new word in this industry. Uh, basically, this is related to automatization, digitization, virtual management. As uh, the traveling has been stopped during this, uh, this, this season, uh, and there's no more factory visits, there's a lot of challenges on doing audits, um, transparency is the new term, which means show me what you have in the floor uh, virtually. Show me where's my PO, where's my fabric, how the production lines are flowing, how your CSR is being managed, how your floor is looking like, what is your efficiency factors, and I want to know it on a virtual, digitalized way. So these uh, te technologies are coming and, and are as a new expectation, but of course this doesn't happen from one day to another. Uh, it is expected that factories have to accommodate to this. It will be as important to buy an automatic cutting machine. It will be as important to have a digital software to be transparent and, and share all this information with the buyers at their headquarters. So this is the new trend on how this is going to look like. The, the value chain is being uh, reconfigurated, um, lesser 
production, product development time, which means reduced samples time, better controlling material uh, waste, buyer's preference pursuing vertical operation. This is what we've been discussing at, at, the, at the project hub, uh, the concept of regional value chain. I was happy to, to learn that the, the, the few producers that are doing already the fabric in, in the region are being uh, certified for larger, large companies in the US and, and starting to use uh, local fabric. That means that they want to move away from, from the dependency of, uh, of the fabric of materials from the Far East, which has an immediate impact on the apparel sector. So buyers are saying, this, even though we have great uh, opportunities in, in Africa as far as labor and, and quality and speed to market, we're still dependent of Far East materials, which is the biggest challenge because of, of course, all, of all the situation that COVID had presented. So the three main words, you have to memorize these three words when you talk to your buyers, transparency, collaborative sourcing, and a speed to market. Those are the three words that have to be on the table when you are were, were discussing orders with your, with your uh, clients uh, during and um, after this season. Mm, what is uh, another industry insights? Most companies are looking to diversify uh, sourcing base. Of course, China still the major player, but one of the latest, uh, actually is a May survey for Gartner uh, uh, to the industry in, in America, and 33% have shared that they wanna move out of China. So that's a big, uh, it just came out uh, two or three weeks ago, the results of that survey, but I was impressed that the 33% of the industry leaders uh, have sh shared that they want to uh, be out of China, 33% of the of this large industry. More companies are using the United States, Mexico, and, and Canada. Uh, the Caribbean prey based in It's like um, Anders is having a challenge with uh, his connection this morning. Um, we just give him a minute to see if we can reconnect, then we can proceed. The challenges of technology. More clothes per year, they buy more clothes and that's a sustainable uh, okay. market. And the trade relations with China are really in a good, in a bad moment. This is just basically a, a, a map that shows how important is this 92 billion business market and how many countries around the world are, are looking to, to supply to this market. Thank Excuse you. Me. Excuse me. Um, we lost you again. <laughs> we lost you again for about a, a, few, a few seconds. So if you could just go back and, and just conclude this particular slide. No, the slide after no, the slide after this. Yeah. We missed the second half of this. Okay, thank you. So, sorry about that. So, what I, uh, I just want to show in this very, you know, visual figure, uh, how the suppliers are are trying to reach this 92 billion business. In other words, we're not alone. The the, the Mexican Canada agreement is allowing uh, near shoring the Caribbean basin. A partnership, including Haiti, Dominican Republic, the Andean Trade Preference and Track Eradication Act also provides zero import duty to the U.S. market and, of course, AGOA and China, Bangladesh, Vietnam. So everybody is trying to get a piece of this market, and we have to be just smart enough and, and understand how to reach this uh, huge market. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Andres. Uh, that, that was quite... Uh... That was quite informative. Um, there, there are a few questions that have come up that I think we can quickly address before we move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, Abel Kamau is asking, what is the process for a manufacturer to comply with FDA and other reg related regulations to export to, the, uh, to export to the US PPE market? Is there some few highlights that you can share as far as that is concerned? Yes, uh, they have to get a 401k form, which is basically like an like a authorization form. Every importer has to do that. 
But moreover, you need a, a, a buyer that has to comply with all these regulations because they have to get the permits to merchandise internally in the U.S. market. When they have that permit, importing and following all these uh, uh, procedures established in, 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 in Customs and Border Patrol uh, website, it'll be uh, fairly easy to do it. So uh, there's a lot of forms and, and regulations uh, that uh, in the link I provided, uh, just want to make sure you, you take note. Uh, this is uh, where you're going to find step by step. Uh, even though it's a lot of regulation, it's very streamlined. Everything is clear there. And um, again, you need to buyer that has the authorization to merchandise locally these products. They get their own permits. But for importing purposes, you need to fill a 401k form, which you're going to disclose what are you doing, where are you located, what is the context of your products, and then follow the procedures for importing purposes. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll ask one more question and then we move, we move on to the next presentation. Um, and for the audience, please, um, I just want to emphasize that post your questions in the Q&A tab, that way we're able to track them. Um, and as, as we proceed, please just keep putting in your questions. We'll be able to address them when we get to Q&A proper. So one, there's an interesting question here from uh, Ayu, for you, um, uh, Andres. How does, he's asking, how does the speed to market affect Africa where fabrics are imported from Asia? Right, that's a great question. Uh, and and let, me, let me answer from my own experience. When I was running my business in Bolivia, I had the same question. So the way I managed is to find a, an alternative route to get to the market via air. And I was two days over in the US market. I was charging three to four dollars per piece. At this point, what the importers want is to put the goods in the hands of the consumer. Therefore, the opportunities to be flexible in the price point are related directly to the time frame. Now, the, the main challenge there is to avoid buying fabric from China because there you have 30, 35 days to get to, the, to Africa. Then you have the timing to produce. And that's, that's an issue, all right? So in that sense, speed to market it is also related to developing a regional value chains where you can find local fabric suppliers that are gonna reduce that time frame. Even though the price point are higher with local fabric, the, the, the spread to put those garments in the market are much more interesting to have it in, in, in three, four weeks than waiting three, four months at a reduced price. So speed to market also comes with a, with a price point that can be neutralized but about supplying that. There has to be many alternatives, many opportunities in this sense. Uh, speed to market is a big concept right now, and there's so many ways around it. Uh, like I mentioned, alternative routes, how to get there, even air shipping, especially on samplers, and uh, moreover, trying to find re regional value chain uh, uh, providers, or even work in product, products that are called basic stock replenishment, which means a fabric stock in your inventory that has a cost a financial you can have arrangement with your buyers to say hey i'm going to give you this program i will produce in uh, quick response programs in three four weeks with fabric that is already set enough for you even even if it's a great fabric or it's going to go into color trends and, and die quickly or just you know already die fabric sitting in my in my warehouse and then I'm going to pull it and just uh, uh, cut and make and trim uh, in, in two, three weeks and then ship it to you. So there has to be multiple ways to approach the buyers to make this work. I see. Thank you. Um, if you could just summarize for us the three key words that you talked about. Those transparency, speed to market. Collaborative sourcing yes. and speed to market. Yes. If you can, if you can provide this to a buyer, you get their attention. And what is collaborative sourcing? I just said it. I'm giving you the options, the alternatives to, to be closer to the market and, and, and to be, uh, uh, provide quick responses, provide fabric structures, uh, adjustments to the samples, have internet connection just to have a digital uh, sampling approval process. As you can see on the spot, well, how the sample looks like, how the stitching is looking like, what the adjustments are. And all those factors are reducing the time. Whatever is going to reduce the time, starting with the design of the new trends on, on fashion designs that's going to come in the next season through product development, fabric sourcing, and the last portion, which is the 
the one that, that Africa has advantages, which is the cut and sew. But again, uh, transparency has to go into play with this uh, chain of, of digital information that's going to give buyers the confidence that they're dealing with a company that understands and they can see on real life what's going on in, in their product and their business. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, so for the audience, there's, there's enough questions that are coming through in the Q&A. We will have time to address all your questions, hopefully, um, when we're done with our presentations. I thought I should take those quick questions just to clarify what Andres was, was presenting. So thank you very much, Andres. Um, I will now move the conversation to emerging trends in social compliance, certification for US apparel and footwear. And to guide us through this, um, we're pleased to have with us uh, Avedis Seferian, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the president and CEO of Worldwide Responsible Accredited Production, or RAP. Um, and as, a very, as Avedis is uh, getting ready, I just want to say a few words about him. Um, a Seferian has extensive knowledge of social responsibility issues within the highly complex world, worldwide supply chains of apparel, textile, and footwear sectors, and is a recognized expert in the area of social compliance and responsible sourcing. Contributing to, to this conversation across multiple channels, Mr. Seferian is also the chairman of the executive board and a member of the stakeholder board of the Association of Professional Social Compliance Auditors, APSCA, and sits on the impartiality committees of several audit organizations. So I want to hand over to uh, Avedis. Please take over. The floor is yours. Thank you, Maxwell. And thank you for the invitation to be with you here today. Good afternoon to all of you attending in Africa, and good morning to my friends uh, here in the US. I'm looking forward to talking to you about emerging trends in social compliance when it comes to doing business uh, in, in the apparel and footwear sectors with the US. Um, and Andres has uh, set the stage in some sense for this because he mentioned uh, how CSR as an issue continues to be such a critical one uh, for this industry and, and, and increasingly so. Uh, so we're gonna talk about some of the emerging trends. What I'm gonna cover in the next 15 minutes uh, or so uh, very, very quickly give you an overview of, of RAP so you have some context in which to place uh, my remarks. Um, and then instead of simply talking about trends as they are right now, uh, I want to put them in context as well and see how they have emerged and, and begin by understanding what it is about the modern marketplace that makes these trends uh, turn out the way they are. Uh, we will talk about the evolution of trends in social compliance once we answer the question you know why social compliance matters right and then we will look at how uh, how those trends have evolved over the 25 years or so that the concept of social compliance has been in place uh, i'll talk about the evolution both in terms of practices how it's been done and also in terms of paradigms how it's been thought about in the uh, space over the last couple of decades. And of course, I will touch upon the handful of hot topics that currently are at the forefront of the conversation um, before then looking ahead a little bit and making some predictions about trends going forward, both in the positive sense, what is to be expected, and in the normative sense, what ought to be the path forward uh, in the post-pandemic world before I conclude and then maybe have some time for a question or two uh, before the final Q&A at the end of the panel. Um, I can see that the audience is a very engaged one from both the nature and the number of questions Andres got, so I'm very excited to be here, and then I thank you again for, for making the time to talk about this. Uh, very quickly, then, to tell you about RAP, Worldwide Responsible Accredited Production. Uh, we are the world's largest independent factory-based certification program that's focused on this industry. There are other uh, programs like ours that certify social compliance, but we're the only ones that are dedicated to the apparel, footwear, some product sector as such. Uh, while our industry scope may be limited by design, our geographic scope is not. We inspect and certify factories all over the world, including, of course, East Africa and, and the rest of that, the continent. Um, how we describe ourselves is we're an objective nonprofit team of global social compliance experts. That, that's who we are. What we do is we promote safe, lawful, humane, and ethical manufacturing throughout the world. That's our mission. That's what we do. And how we do it 
is through certification. You know, we inspect factories and make sure they are meeting these standards and validate that fact to uh, pr their prospective buyers. That's kind of our core deliverable. And also education, we consider that part of our mission and events like this, opportunities to engage with the, with the industry, with manufacturers is always something we look forward to and, and are again grateful to the organizers for giving us this opportunity. Our approach has always been to work with industry, right? We, we believe we are in the sort of CSR space, uh, but we don't consider ourselves an activist organization in, you know, in the, in the uh, more traditional NGO sense. We want to help industry get better. We believe that that's where the opportunity is. That's where the power to actually make changes. So we want to engage with industry, both on the manufacturer side and on the buyer side and position ourselves as the program of choice for industry. Uh, for example, here in the United States, the Apex trade body, the association of the buyers, brands and retailers is the AAFA, the American Apparel and Footwear Association. RAP is AAFA's official corporate social responsibility partner because we believe, again, in engaging with industry to bring about the changes that we want. And those changes are all tied to the 12 RAP principles that form the foundation of our program. I won't go into detail here, but these are the sort of topic level uh, issues that, that we address in our in RAP audits. Um, and as you can see, they cover the usual, what you would expect, the core ILO conventions, international labor organization conventions and expectations for what will constitute a uh, responsible and, and ethical uh, working environment. Um, one final thing I'll say to you know, in form of introduction, I mentioned we're the world's largest uh, certification program for this space. Uh, this is sort of just our top 20 list for, for uh, top 10 rather, sorry, for 2019. And you can see no surprises there that it traces the top apparel exporting countries of the world. Um, I would love to see an African, especially an East African country, climb up this list. Uh, we saw, of course, the trend uh, looking good for Kenya, Ethiopia, and, and East Africa as a whole. So hopefully that will continue. Uh, we received a little over 3,000 applications last year. Uh, and, and as of right now, uh, the end of the second, the third quarter of this year, there are just under 2,700 factories employing roughly 2.7 million workers uh, in 41 countries to be exact that currently have a RAP certificate. So as you can see, we have a pretty, pretty uh, solid footprint. Um, and it gives us uh, a lot of context and a lot of knowledge to, to ask the question and be the resource for the answer to why social compliance? What is it about this exercise that is so important? And really the blunt answer is in the form of a quote that I encountered a while ago that I really think speaks to the issue very, very well. And here it is. It takes 20 years to build a reputation, but only five minutes to ruin it. And if you think about that, you'll do things differently. I don't know if you've heard this quote before, but it was by a gentleman named Warren Buffett, whom you may have heard of, the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, a very intelligent businessman, very rich man. Uh, when Warren says something about business, I tend to listen and I, I tend to agree for the most part. Although I think he did get something a little bit wrong here. I think he is right about the fact that it takes a long time, 20 years, longer to build a reputation. But honestly, nowadays, you can ruin it in a lot faster than five minutes. Because today the world has the blessing and in some sense, you know, the curse of modern communication that enables information to spread farther and faster than ever before. And that's the context in which you need to place yourself to truly understand the emergence of social compliance trends and why they are more than ever before important to stay abreast of. Because the modern marketplace, you know, Andres showed you that, that uh, illustrative map, 92 billion market in the US, you know, and all, all the world servicing it. That's right, physically speaking, that's, that's how the, the flows go. But really the modern marketplace isn't a geography. The modern marketplace is this right here. It's all the online stuff that, that goes out there. The Facebook posts and the, the tweets and the, Instagram uh, uh, postings and all of the stuff. This is where you're competing. This is where consumers are talking about you, whether you're a brand or a manufacturer, because the 
consumers for you as manufacturers, the buyers, the brands and retailers are themselves talking amongst each other much more easily, much more freely with the aid of modern communication. Right? And this has elevated the conversation around responsible sourcing, responsibility to society of a business in ways that has never happened before. And just to share with you a couple of covers from two influential magazines through the latter part of last year, The Economist in August of 2019 and Fortune in September of 2019, both ran extensive pieces on this idea of the purpose of a corporation. Right? Is it simply to make money? Is it simply to increase profits? And the conclusion was quite clear that it isn't. You have to have a social purpose as well. And that it means for corporations making sure that they are addressing labor issues throughout their supply chain. This is the context in which this conversation is now taking place. And you have to understand that these pressures are real, are being felt by the, certainly the publicly traded corporations, but Corporations across the board of all stripes understanding the importance of increased attention to social responsibility. Right. So in that context, now knowing where we are, let's look back a little bit and, and, and confront a few realities that have given the emergence of these trends, the setting in which they, they occurred. Uh, it starts off with recognizing that social compliance got off on the wrong foot. When we first got going uh, 25 years ago, which is about the age of, of social compliance programs, you know, if you were asked 30 years ago, 35 years ago to show a social compliance certificate, you'd say, I don't know what you're talking about, right? It was only in the mid 1990s, mid to late 90s that the idea emerged. And it emerged as a result of a lot of um, negative publication, negative press that the industry received because of some um, uh, activist NGO exposés of horrible working conditions in outsourced supply chains. As a result of that genesis, uh, social compliance got off on the wrong foot because it was seen as one side of the supply chain being pit pitted against the other. Buyers and manufacturers saw each other through an adversarial lens, and that was not the right way to start. Right? The other problem was that it was, again, because it was seen as one side versus the other, one side wanted to essentially control the other and responsible sourcing rules were made by the buyers and focused on the manufacturers. Again, an unfortunate start to what really should have been a much better collaborative exchange uh, instead of an adversarial one. The other problem with the way <clears throat> it all began is that because it was in response to a crisis, everyone felt they had to move quickly and everyone had to do their own thing. And so Brands and retailers all created their own codes of conduct and all developed their proprietary social compliance programs, which really eventually only resulted in utter fatigue. Uh, if you have, as a, as a factory, multiple different brands and retailers as your clients, as most of you do, you end up having to do multiple different audits because each one insists on doing their own thing. Not a very efficient way of doing things. So the, the history of compliance is one that got off on the wrong foot. Audit fatigue recognized as a problem uh, in the last decade or so, uh, 15 years or so, and many attempts were made to rationalize, harmonize social compliance. Um, they generally took place in two phases, two different flavors perhaps. The first was an attempt to come up with a single universal code that everybody could agree on. All those efforts failed. Second round was, okay, we cannot agree on a single universal code. Can we agree on some kind of a universal process, an equivalency benchmarking perhaps that will have um, a, a, everyone apply their own values and codes, but based off of a unified audit protocol. All those also failed. And really, all these attempts were doomed to fail from the start because they make the mistake of trying to focus on a single solution. And that's simply not an option in this industry. We understand that one size does not fit all in the apparel space, right? Better than any industry, we know the importance of sizing, right? Uh, so let's just all do it one way is not a viable approach and has not worked and is never going to work, right? So that's the background. That's the, the, the sense of, of um, uh, where these trends have emerged from. Let me look forward just a bit before I talk about hot topics and, and uh, uh, bring my remarks to their conclusion. Uh, in this space, 
in recognizing the challenge that this crisis that we're all going through brings us, we also have an opportunity, an opportunity to rethink, reset the paradigm, you know, overcome the false start that we've had as a, as, as a, as a practice um, and do things better in the post pandemic world. And so RAP is proposing in this regard, a new thought paradigm which we call symphonization, not, not harmonization, because that term has come to be, be a loaded one, a negative one. Um, and really what that means is, uh, instead of everyone doing their own audits or attempting to impose a single solution, let's use a menu of options approach. There are professional bodies out there, like RAP and several of our peer organizations that do this. Uh, there are brands and retailers that are recognizing that the need to reduce audit fatigue is, is critical, uh, but we cannot do it the old way, trying to impose one size fits all. Let's all do it just one way, because as I said, one size does not fit all. So let's come up with a way that allows everyone to move at their own pace, recognize the existing credible programs that are out there, like RAP, as I said, and create a menu of option that will say, as long as you got one of these programs, you're okay as far as our social responsibility uh, requirements are concerned. This is what Walmart has done, for example, a couple of years ago, they moved to this approach, much more efficient, much better way of doing this. This is the trend. Disney has been doing this for even longer, but more and more other big players and, and brands are looking at this. So as a trend, this is something to look forward to. And this is certainly something that RAP is promoting. In addition, we are actually calling for collaboration amongst the independent programs as well. So we can further improve the model and make it more efficient to ensure there's no overlap of expertise or, or, or geographies. Um, this is something that ties into what Andre said earlier about, about the need for more resilient, more efficient supply chains and a need that will become even more significant because one other trend that I'm gonna be getting to is that social compliance is now moving further upstream it's no longer simply a first tier exercise, but starting to get uh, uh, more and more engagement with the mills and, and further uh, fabric and, and all the way to the farms even. Uh, and again, an issue, uh, as I said, that Andres brought up because labor concerns are cropping up over there significantly too. Okay, let me give you some of the current actual hot topics and then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, right now, the single biggest issue that is being looked at in the social compliance space and CSR space at large is this case of forced labor, you know, whether in the human trafficking context or in other contexts. Uh, a lot of attention is being paid to this issue, um, increasingly tied to things like migrant labor issues, but also with specific geographies, uh, concerns about how particular ethnic groups or particular um, uh, minorities are being treated. Big issue in many parts of the world, in many different settings, but as I said, the number one challenge that, that folks are addressing. Uh, the other issue that continues to be, it's, it's, a, it's a hot topic, but it's always been a hot topic, is this idea of working hours uh, and tied to that wages, making sure that that's being treated properly and fairly and being paid for appropriately. Um, and in this context, again, uh, uh, to echo something Andres said, uh, transparency uh, in, in understanding this, in, in engaging with the factories, in being able to validate the practices is becoming a, a big uh, uh, trend and an approach that many buyers and compliance programs are taking. Um, the other big trend <clears throat> is looking to technology uh, as, as the basis for some solutions in, <clears throat> excuse me, in specific contexts. Again, to echo the previous speaker, Andres mentioned uh, things like remote audits, uh, things like worker voice uh, platforms, especially as uh, the second quarter in particular this year, saw a real challenge in physically visiting factories. Uh, the idea of looking for ways to do so remotely uh, has become a particularly significant trend right now. And then finally, as I said, the, um, the harmonization standardization approach, which we're calling symphonization, is a big trend as brands look for more partners, look for less reliance <clears throat> on their own programs, especially as they um, uh, continue to uh, move further upstream as they get more and more engaged in the social compliance space. So what are the trends going forward? Some of the positive, you know, we talked a little bit about the normative stuff. 
uh, we're going to see more and more the need for social compliance objectives to be integrated with general management systems. And these trends, by the way, I am now generalizing across the board. These aren't just trends for buyers. These are important trends for you as manufacturers to take into account. You really need to be making sure that your factory social compliance systems are integrated with your general management systems. It's not a standalone siloed operation. You have to treat it with the same level of attention and day-to-day -day management systems approach as you would production systems or any other uh, systems you have in place. Um, again, Andreas talked about you know, collaborative sourcing. Collaboration in general is, is a, an important trend. You need to be engaged with all your stakeholders, not just the buyers, but other community members, other uh, players, because the world we live in makes that communication not only possible, but if you don't do it, others will impose it on you. So it's important to stay engaged, stay abreast, stay ahead of some of these challenges so that you are able to have uh, the kind of trusted relationships you need with your, with your buyers uh, and, and, and to get to that trust and to foster it, transparency is going to be important both on the front end and on the relationship maintenance end. And then understand that an audit is the start of a process. Auditing itself is not gonna solve your problem if you have a problem. Auditing will simply give you information. You have to start there. So those of you who are expecting the audit to be the answer, you know, we'll just get RAP certified and that's the end of that. Uh, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. That's where you get to better understand your processes, better understand where you are and understand that you have to continuously improve because that's what buyers are going to be demanding of you. In the end, really, it's education that we're talking about. That's why it's such a, a, an honor to be a part of this and so, so uh, heartening to see so many of you show up for this and take this uh, matter to heart because it is, it is important. That's pretty much it. Um, just some concluding remarks then. Uh, the modern marketplace, the modern consumer, and as we talked about the need for modern corporations delivering, the demand is for more transparency and for validated responsible sourcing, right? And it's important that these be done uh, in, in a credible fashion through independent programs, and it's been done deeper into the supply chain than before, not just limited to tier one. Therefore, responsible sourcing is now really a critical part of the competition matrix for buyers to incorporate the decision-making process and for you when you go out there to compete to sell your products. It is very much at the center of what people are looking for, at the center of what's gonna make you more competitive. So the bottom line is a properly implemented and credibly certified social compliance program, so RAP, as you can imagine, is necessary. It's not just a good to have, but a necessary thing to do business and not just with the US, but everywhere. Right. On that note, thank you very much, and I will hand it back over to you, Maxwell. Thank you very much, Avedis. That was very, very comprehensive and uh, actually quite interesting. Um, you know, pitch there. Business should have a soul. I, I believe that's, for me, that's the takeout that I got from your presentation. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on quickly to the next uh, presenter, um, and we'll take questions when we get to Q and D. Are those your boys? Yes, those are my boys. Um, and uh, I will stop sharing so the next presenter can show us their kids if they want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I want to pick this up from uh, one of the items you listed there as uh, the hot topics, one of your hot topics. You talked about uh, technology-based solutions. And I want to invite to the stage Michelle Stin Voden, who is going to talk to us about US technology solutions for apparel and PP manufacturing in the COVID environment. Now, um, Michelle is a vice president, uh, professional services for GABA Technologies and leads their global consulting team. This group has been engaged extensively during the COVID pandemic to quickly retool factories to make PPE. Outside of this unique period, a team is responsible for providing industry strategy and implementation services, enabling brands to make the best business decisions. So without much ado, hand it over to you, Michelle. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. I'm excited to be part of this today and looking forward to working together. So just as an introduction, some of you may actually be working with Gerber technology today. Some of you may not. Um, our area of expertise is really the equipment used for production of apparel and really anything having to do with textiles. So that could be packaging, transportation. Many of you are actual producers that might be in this category and using maybe one of our competitor's systems or one of our systems. So we are really specialized in making the spreaders, the tables, the multi-ply cutters, single-ply cutters, and then also all the software that's needed to really run an end-to-end -end workflow for apparel. And as we entered the pandemic period, one of the interesting things that Gerber took on was really trying to be the leader in advising producers who are using our equipment or maybe even our competitors' equipment. We don't mind, we will help you either way. Um, but our goal was to really help retool factories very quickly and very succinctly to PPE production. It's a really interesting period because there's a lot of funds available out there for PPE production, particularly in the US for import, and then also for local production. The interesting thing on the Gerber systems is that as you exit a PPE production period, so maybe you're making masks or gowns for um, a pandemic or a specific need, you can actually use this equipment to then transition back over to other sort of textile manufacturing. So you might move into apparel, um, you might move into making transportation parts like automats, things like that. Really any material that needs to be cut can allow you to make PPE and then switch back to your own industry. So it's a very flexible solution. Just to show you where we are in terms of our customers, some of you might be in this list actually, you probably work with some of these brands and about a quarter of our revenue comes from EMEA. So a number of those producers are yourselves in East Africa and we love working with the manufacturers because we can really talk about our software solutions and how they can go direct to production. So one thing we'll talk a little bit more here as we get into our actual project as um, we entered the pandemic is how do we help you and how do you very quickly move over to that PPE production? So the things that you're gonna need, we've sort of, we've done this so many times that we know the common questions, you know, can we get a pattern? How do we find the materials? Um, where do you get those raw materials from? How do you actually cut them without the fabric fusing? A number of you might be working with different types of materials today and as you move into gowns and mass production, there's actually very thin materials that you'll need to deal with and so they can fuse easily. And our team's here to kind of help and guide you along the way and ensure that no material is wasted. It's a very expensive commodity, especially during the period of the pandemic. And also that you can easily transition to and out of PPE production as needed. So our project really started probably back in January. We actually have a large presence in APAC. We have a team in Shanghai, and they were the first to experience the pandemic. And out of that, we actually had a technology center in Shanghai that had to quickly change over. And typically it's used for creating demos for our customers and showing off our equipment. We changed that over to PPE production. And as part of that, we learned a lot about our own equipment, about the challenges with the material. Um, we also created patterns for things like um, masks, coveralls, shoe covers, gowns, both disposable and reusable. And we said, well, we have all this material. Why would we keep it to ourselves? So we essentially created a resource site that is still available today. And this resource site will allow you to access a number of free patterns and tech packs. So if you wanna take a screenshot of the link over here on the right, it's a really handy free resource. And we've partnered with a number of our own customers who during the pandemic were um, eager to share their own findings in terms of how to build the most efficient gown. How do you make a pattern that you, know, you could lay together with gowns and shoe covers and um, different things that would utilize the maximum amount of fabric. And so all of this is available for free. There's lots of material information on the resource site. So we, we tried to list every time that we encountered 
uh, a supplier that actually had in stock material of raw um, materials and trims. We put that out on the resource site to help everyone. And then we also provided matchmaking capabilities. And all of this, again, it's just provided for free. We're still doing it today. But if you are producing something and there's a particular um, provider looking for that type of product in the US, we would link you together and provide that as a service. And so it's just all available on the site. I encourage everybody to sign up. There's a lot of really good information out there. Now, what did our task force really do and what can we help you with going forward? Beyond that free resource site, we've engaged my consulting team and essentially this is made up of industry experts. So we have folks that are really, um, they have decades of experience on producing PPE, non-PPE items and can really understand your production floor. We've gotten pretty agile during this period and provided services via FaceTime. There's a lot of help where a factory might just be experiencing some sort of issue with their spreader, for instance, maybe there's a static problem. And we've had FaceTime with one of our consultants and they can easily help you. You know, during the COVID period, nobody really wants to have extra people on site. So we've been able to get around that challenge. We've also had particularly as people look to import into the US, you heard Andreas earlier talk about the 510K, the 510K as it's normally called. And that is a um, FDA requirement that we can help you with. We have an FDA consultant that essentially can either take two approaches. They can provide you with guidelines and some checklists on how to establish your business and register with the FDA, which is a requirement to distribute in the US. The next step would be actually talking about what products or product family as they, as they call it, will you be creating? So are you gonna do gowns, masks? Are you going to do both? And you'll need to register those um, as product families under your business on the FDA site. And then essentially you'll need to meet different levels of testing of either the material or the product as you look at actually obtaining those 510Ks for each product. Right now we are working under the EUA that was mentioned earlier. So technically you can distribute um, without having your full 510K in the US. The challenge is that is gonna end soon. Um, we've heard from our consultant, you know, it's really hearsay, there's no hard date set, but likely in the next few months, the EUA could end. And so that would stipulate that you absolutely need to have your 510K in order to do business in the US. And so that's something really critical. We've helped a number of international suppliers work through that. There are two approaches that our team can do. We can engage our consultant um, hourly, or she can actually do it on your behalf if you would just like to outsource that. Other things that we've provided as part of the task force is maybe you need some patterns graded. Maybe you found a particularly good pattern for a gown and you just need to change that in order to meet a certain uh, order, or maybe there's a certain requirement you're trying to meet. And we can help you with that in case you don't have a pattern maker on hand. Not everybody does, especially um, on the factory floor. So we can certainly help you with that. If you look at retooling your factory over to PPE, this is a really good slide to take a screenshot of. And it's a good reference, certainly something that my team would use as a blueprint as we go into any company. So essentially in a week, we could retool a factory over to PPE production. We've seen this with manufacturers. Sometimes it can go as quick as even three days, depending on how quickly they can get the material and if they have the right equipment. So those are the first two questions you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself. Um, what sort of equipment are you using for spreading and cutting? Are you gonna be doing that with a machine or by hand? And making sure that you can obtain the materials in the lead time. Once you have that, finding the patterns, I, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's something that we can help you with. There's a lot of free resources out there. So finding the right patterns, optimizing those, and then quickly rolling those into production is what you're gonna to look to do. Um, this is where we also could check your um, FDA requirements and see for your particular product, 
do you need that full 510k? Do you, are you going to use it just for the next few months under the EUA? Or potentially, you know, do you need to get the product um, approved or just the material? The FDA has separated everything into four levels of PPE, and we can, um, as a follow-up to this webinar, send you a matrix that will demonstrate kind of what you need to do for masks and gowns, the two most popular items. In terms of retooling your factory, so step two is really going to be understanding not only the pattern, but the tech pack. How are you gonna actually produce and assemble that item? Do you have all the right pieces of trim and are you in order? If for instance, you uh, want to work with a tech pack and you don't have a way to open that, we have a free license available for our tool for anybody producing PPE. So no problem there, just reach out to us and we'll get you set up. Ultimately, we're gonna run a, run a test run for production and make sure that your spreader, again, static is a big issue with these fabrics, especially if you're looking at masks and things like that. Um, there are solutions to it, but you need to make sure that you understand um, the number of ply that you can lay and then ultimately create a marker file that's gonna fit all those pieces of the pattern in like a puzzle and very efficiently cut that fabric if you're using an automated cutter. And so that's something that we can do on your behalf. It's something our task force has been doing a lot for producers is just fitting all those puzzle pieces in so that you're using as much fabric, very sustainable, um, lowering the amount of waste. It's, it's a really good service that we can provide there. Ultimately, um, what we can do in terms of training, we've learned a ton from other producers and we wanna share this with yourselves as well as your colleagues. And so we're happy to get on a FaceTime, um, maybe a Zoom meeting, any sort of live video share, and we can see what you're doing, if there's any issues, questions, um, Gerber can engage. And again, this is if you're using a Gerber cutter, if you're not, even if you're hand cutting, um, we've answered some questions for producers in all categories, and we're happy to be there for you. Um, our goal is to help you retool your factory within a week. And we've met this with a number of other producers. We're happy to engage with you all. And especially as you look to export into the US, there's a lot of opportunity and lessons learned along the way that we're happy to share. And the resource site is really key. And lastly, ad hoc support. We're happy to be your phone a friend if you need to call somebody up to see if you know, there's a question maybe after you've been producing PPE for a few months and you want to add a new product, how can you quickly do that? What materials would we suggest? How would we suggest um, actually assembling that? These are all things that you can use us as a service. Um, and we're really excited to work with your region and see that there's interest. It's, um, it's a pretty exciting area of the world. And I know that there's a lot of opportunity. That's all I have for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle. This is fascinating stuff. Um, the ability to be able to convert a factory in, a, in under a week in certain yeah. times is simply phenomenal. Um, so in the interest of time, um, we do have some questions coming in, but um, we're starting to run a bit out of time. So I want us to move quickly to the next uh, presenter um, and we'll take questions at the end. So please, audience, just keep typing in your questions. We'll try as much as possible to cover as many questions when we get to Q&A. So thank you, um, Michelle. And uh, I want to invite at this point, um, Roger Bard, um, who's going to talk to us about project funding and uh, transaction advisory support services for investments in the East Africa apparel sector. Roger is the chief of party for USAID's Kenya Investment Mechanism, implemented by Palladium Group. He has been a banker for more than 40 years, specializing in agricultural lending and international development. For the past 25 years, Roger has helped and has served farmers across the globe to gain access to credit and mechanization. Welcome, Roger. Great, thank you so much, Maxwell. And it's really a pleasure to be here. And one of the joys about being a banker is that you get to learn a lot of things about a lot of different industries. And so I really applaud the the skill and uh, professionalism, um, certainly the experience of, of all the speakers so far today. I'm sure it's all beneficial to all of our, our participants as well. Um, the, the Kenyan Investment Mechanism is a five-year USAID 
funded activity that is implemented by Palladium. Uh, the program is designed to unlock $400 million of investments. And we do that through, um, a, through a market incentive that uh, is a reward uh, system based on success. Uh, we do it by working to uh, improve policies and regulations that actually provide a more open and transparent operating environment that gives uh, investors uh, confidence and thereby greater willingness to invest. And by partnering with market leaders that are bringing innovative solutions uh, at scale to increase access to credit. In, in our particular case, particularly for smallholder agriculture. Um, now the Kenyan investment mechanism was originally designed to support, support Kenya. Kenya. And, and agriculture, and we're excited to uh, be expanded um, into our coverage uh, through East, in East Africa. Um, now, East Africa for us is defined as the EAC plus uh, Ethiopia. Now, the way we support the market is a bit different uh, because we're not a program of grants uh, or de-risking loans for lenders or buy down of interest rates. Instead, we offer a market incentive system through what we call pay for performance, which means just simply that. So we address both the demand side and the supply side of the market, and we play a role of kind of matchmaker, or what I like to say, the market maker, that brings both the supply and the de demand together to make a deal. So here's how. What we've learned is, particularly in the agribusiness, is that they have limited access to business advisory services. And SMEs may not understand or value necessarily some of these services as much as they could. Uh, now, in addition, financial institutions, they tend to avoid certain market segments, uh, where, and they also tend to uh, avoid utilizing the services of transaction advisors. Um, and so what we are looking to be able to do is kind of bring all that together in a, in a financial ecosystem to be able to add value. So we designed an incentive system that basically nudges financial institutions to move into underserved markets. And it encourages them to work with transaction advisors um, and incentivize the transaction advisors to engage and support enterprises that actually are then raising the capital. So when a financial institution makes a loan to the targeted area that we are, are focusing on, they, they earn a fee for that. And when the transaction advisors um, secure financing for an enterprise, they earn a fee for that. So simply a pay for performance. Uh, and it's really working quite well. Um, in the, um, uh, since June of 2019, we have closed uh, just about $110 million. Uh, and we can see that about 65% of that has actually been facilitated by transaction advisors. So we're actually getting the, the market to respond quite well using this uh, incentive system. Uh, we have currently 60 uh, financial institutions and transaction advisors in the Kenyan Investment Mechanism Network. So, the target area for Kenyan investment mechanism originally started out to be agriculture, but then it's expanded into energy and infrastructure, health, uh, water and sanitation and hygiene. And in addition, we're supported by the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Program um, and uh, the initiative and also Prosper Africa. So then it becomes a question I think for this audience is where does textile manufacturing fit? And actually it's in a number of areas. So if you're a woman owned business, clearly that's going to fit under the WGDP program. Uh, if your business is in fact retooling to do PPEs, uh, that would clearly fall under the health funding areas, uh, certainly to support COVID. And of course there is Prosper Africa, which is actually sector agnostic. And one of the big initiatives out of the US government whereby we're looking to be able to increase trade and investment between the United States and Africa. And under that initiative, basically what we're looking to do is find transactions that will directly involve investments, either debt or equity, by a US owned entity into any East African entity, actually African entity, but we are working in East Africa. 
Uh, other transactions where the enterprise has 20% or more US ownership or transactions that uh, directly support a measurable Africans exports and imports within the United States. So one example of that would be uh, Shona EPZ, who is located here in Kenya. Um, and I know that uh, Isaac is in the audience uh, today. Uh, we're really thrilled to have been able to participate and uh, partner with uh, their transaction advisor um, and assist Shona be able to actually receive some financing uh, to be able to help retool themselves into making some PPE equipment. Um, <clears throat> so we're really thrilled that um, uh, the transaction advisors have taken up this initiative within Kenya and, and also we have uh, two primary transaction advisors who work in East Africa with lots of experience. Um, and the last thing and I'll say is that I was really, um, it was interesting to see some of the respondents uh, who are seeking financing um, in terms of the statistics. Most of the financing sought is within the 250,000 to $1.5 million range, which we often call the missing middle. It's an area that we tend to focus on. Um, and so we're, we're, uh, it's no surprise to be able to see that. One last comment that I'll make is that we, as part of our initiative, as we do strategic partnerships uh, with uh, key companies to be able to help scale up financing. And in response to COVID-19, we're aggressively seeking new funding opportunities to bring those into Kenya or East Africa. And these two particular companies, Tisserine Capital and Vital Capital uh, together have you know, been able to bring in about 60 million of funds that they're looking to invest in Kenyan and East African enterprises specifically to address the fallout from COVID-19. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Uh, here's a way in which you can reach out to us uh, to be able to get some more information. And again, I really am thrilled to be a part of this, uh, this group. Thank you so much, Maxwell. Thank you very much, Roger. That was uh, concise and to the point. Um, I want to switch gears here and uh, bring in the audience into the conversation. Um, we've had several questions coming in, um, the Q&A, some in the chat. I just want to encourage the audience to uh, keep sending in their questions um, on the, on the Q&A tab. And I'll ask um, the rest of the panelists to please turn on their videos so that we're able to engage with the audience. Um, so I think the first question that I've seen here will be a quick one to, uh, to Roger. Um, Mag, Meg, sorry, Meg uh, Jacque is asking whether you have any programs um, in Uganda. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the way in which the Kenyan investment mechanism is reaching out to East Africa is through our transaction advisors. We have two uh, transaction advisors who are part of the Kenyan investment mechanism network. It's cross boundary uh, and open capital, and they do have a network and have experience throughout East Africa. And so we would be looking to be able to match those, uh, those companies interested uh, in the East African countries into, uh, into their networks. Okay, fantastic. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll try and cover as many questions as possible in the time that we have left. Um, I'll start off with uh, Angels. There's, there's several questions that have come through for you. Um, the first one is from Joseph Nyagari, who's asking um, that he stated that the, some farms have been certified to use local fabric. Do you have examples in East Africa that you can share? Thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, like in Tanzania, we have a, a firm A to Z and the NICT mm. uh, utilizing local cotton from Tanzania has been uh, certified and supplying to the region. Uh, in Ethiopia, we have uh, seen investments coming from the Far East. Uh, JJ Textiles is uh, one of them. Uh, there is a, a, in, in Madagascar also another uh, mill called Sakata. And um, there are multiple uh, examples in the uh, region. Um, I have seen another uh, question from, from the audience uh, that I would love to get connected. I think it's coming 
uh, from this, uh, there's a new, there's a, a factory that produces fabric that I wasn't aware. So uh, the more factories we have in the region, the better opportunities that the, that the, the region has for, for exporting uh, what we call the full package. So this is moving towards that, uh, um, that uh, trend and, and there's some examples that are uh, already successful. Thank you. Yeah, and, and as a quick follow up to that question, um, there was somebody who sent in a question earlier asking whether um, the US market, uh, yeah, actually whether you can advise whether US market buyers of fabrics would be interested in 100% cotton hand loom woven fabric. Any comments on that? Yes, um, the AGOA benefit gives uh, a reduction of import duty when you use cotton fabric, which is about 17%. Uh, nevertheless, if you move into the poly cotton, polyester blends, the import duty is, is higher, it's 32%. Uh, so in, in that sense, it would make more sense to utilize uh, poly cottons. But I have not seen in East Africa uh, yet uh, um, a factory that can provide polycotton. So mainly that's coming from Taiwan, Korea, and or China. Uh, but yeah, uh, it, the cotton is, is a fabric that, that is, it's called, you know, the, the gold in, in the apparel industry. And I have seen multiple countries uh, providing cotton, like Uganda, big cotton producer. They are implementing the, cost, the cotton textile apparel um, strategy based on, on that factor uh, being the cotton as, as, as uh, equal in quality standards uh, as the uh, Egypt cotton. So the, the raw material, it's in East Africa. It's already there in, in plenty of them, including Tanzania, Uganda. Uh, the question there is, what does it take to East Africa to start investing in, in, in having this uh, supply chain integrated? And, and that's the challenge that I, I throw back to, to, the, to the audience, knowing that this is a huge market. Any investor should be focusing on, uh, on moving towards not only on the labor portion, which is the CMT, but also, and more importantly, in the fabric uh, development and, and production process, which comes from, from the ginneries, from the spinning and kneading and dyeing, which is a lot of technology and, of course, investment. But that's the trend. That's where you're going to be a major actor in the industry because on the labor portion, there's too many actors, too many players. Central America, 0 0.002 cents per, per minute in the sewing. I mean, hard to compete, plus two days shipping transit to the U.S. So fabric, it's 40% of the cost, and that's where the investment and the strategy of all East African countries should go, definitely. Interesting insight there. Thank you. Um, Avedis. Um, yes, Yesuf Hagos is uh, asking in the credit factories, what do you charge? One, do you have a special support for factories in developing countries, especially in Africa? And then the third question from him is what requirements should factories fulfill in order to get this, your certification? And I'll combine that with a question from uh, Joseph Nyagari, um, who's asking whether you could share a list of independent certification programs you work with in the East Africa region? Over to you. Uh, great questions. The, the second one I'll tackle first. Uh, we are an independent certification program and we work all over the world. So I'm not sure I, I understand the, the context of that. If maybe the, the um, question was what audit partners we have, firms that we work with in the region, that, that, that might make a little bit more sense. Uh, you can find by, depending on which country you have in mind, you can find the list on our website. We have several partners that can service factories all over Africa and certainly uh, uh, multiple options for East Africa. Um, as for the practical questions uh, in, in the first set of ones you raised, I appreciate them. Thank you. Uh, the, the charge for a wrap process is a flat fee for the factory to register of 1,195 US dollars. Um, and then the audit fee to actually go through the process will depend on the factory size. Uh, there are guidelines for how many man days the audit must be, depending on how many employees the factory has. They range in the neighborhood of $500 to $600 a man day, depending on the exact location. A typical wrap audit will be, depending on a mid-sized factory of a few hundred workers, you know, 
one and a half, two man days. So altogether, uh, the, the, the initial audit will probably be about a, a, another thousand dollars. So uh, two thousand, twenty two hundred dollars uh, investment for that initial wrap audit is, is what the charge uh, would be. As for uh, resources, yes, we're happy to help any factory, not simply Africa. I mean, all our factories uh, are, are export oriented units and they all tend by and large to be in the developing world for obvious reasons, the kind of stuff Andres talked about in terms of competitiveness. So we have a lot of resources on our website that can, that can be helpful uh, at no charge. Obviously, we're, we're happy to provide additional training opportunities and point you in, in the resources that you might want to invest in uh, from a financial perspective. But uh, the simplest thing to do, that third of those initial set of questions are what are the things the factory should do even before you register, this is going to sound strange for me to say, don't register, don't pay wrap any money yet, but, but I mean it. Even before you do that, on our website, the pre-assessment uh, self, uh, the pre-audit self-assessment, P-A-S-A, is available for free on our website to download without any charge. You don't even have to tell us your email address. You can simply download that document, and it really is a detailed set of questions that prepare you for the audit. If you can honestly answer those questions, and you have the evidence to back up those answers, you will be in fine shape. Uh, it is essentially an open book exam in that sense because it really outlines all the requirements. It's a very detailed document. And as I said, it's on our website in the resources section. So it is something that every factory uh, should take advantage of. Um, and as I mentioned, even before you register with RAP, you know, don't, don't send us any money until you actually know you're ready for the process. So happy to provide further details if you want uh, to any of the questionnaires. Uh, you can reach out to me directly. Thank you, ladies. Um, let me bring in Michelle. Michelle, there's a question here from Grace Angela Kirabo, who's asking whether it's possible to get um, a tech pack or any tech pack for any design required, or is it only, is the technology only limited to PPE? No, um, PPE was just the focus of this task force. So all of our software as well as our, our hardware, so our cutters, our spreaders, can all help you with just normal apparel, um, really the management of any sort of tech pack. So our, our PLM system is called Unique PLM. And if you're interested in getting a free trial just to manage your normal tech packs in your business, feel free to reach out to me. I dropped my email in the chat for Joseph, but anybody can reach out, no problem. All right, thank you. Um, and there's a, there's a question here that could, could have been uh, addressed to you, but uh, Roger can also address it as well. Um, Youssef Hagos is asking whether you finance the companies. Uh, do you purchase machines or do you provide cash, cash for working capital? And is a form in the support of a grant or a credit? Actually, I think this should go to um, Roger. Yes, great. Thanks for, thanks for that question, Youssef. Uh, it's a good clarifying question. So the Kenyan Investment Mechanism actually is not the financier. We, we actually are helping connect the market with um, uh, those looking for funding um, to those looking to invest. Uh, and so the way in which the assets or the working capital or whatever that finance uh, source is, um, is dispersed, that's between the investor or the financier and the company within the transaction itself. Uh, I have seen it go both ways. Uh, there are a couple of examples that where the company, um, the lender is actually purchasing the equipment directly uh, from the supplier acting as the importer, which is some advantage to some of the companies. Uh, but I've also seen it where the, the financing is actually made in the form of cash disbursements to the, the company itself of which then they uh, spend money through um, uh, purchasing directly. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know we have Isaac Maluki um, from Shona on the line. Um, Eva, if you could give Isaac an opportunity to ask his question live. Isaac, please go ahead. Hello, good, good evening, and uh, thank you for um, letting me just talk. First of all, um, for all your presentations, they were very, very interesting. Uh, I think for me, I got a lot of points that I could uh, put together and, and follow up. Uh, I think one of the questions I was wanted to ask was um, uh, regarding um, just the interest in being FDA approved. Uh, I think uh, 
um, Avedis, you were able to talk to, to answer the question about RAP audit, uh, um, how we can be able to get certified. And Andres has also helped me with that. Um, but I would like to know just how, what processes, what steps can, can we do right now to actually get FDA approved? I can take that if you'd like, uh, at least start off. So what we've been helping customers do is, and we can even provide some quick reference guides. The very first step is to establish your business with the FDA, and there's a fee just over 5,000 US dollars to do so. And once you establish your business, you can then register each of the products, the PPE products that you wish to make. And then that would put you on the path towards eventually getting your 510K. You know, there's some additional fees along the way, but essentially that's gonna depend on how many product families and what levels and the testing will also depend on what levels. What I'm, I've actually forwarded it on to Maxwell. There's a matrix, as I mentioned earlier. So if you're making level, um, one gowns, it's very different than a level four gown. Level four is, you know, impermeable suit and requires a lot more testing. Level one is more of a disposable patient gown, if you will. And so depending on where you are in that spectrum, you'll have to um, prove that either the material has been tested or that the actual product has been tested to pass the uh, appropriate FDA regulations. And I'm sure others have information to add, so feel free. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I do you have anything to add on to that? Uh, yes, um, I just uh, answer Isaac uh, on the chat a few minutes ago. We just produced a document that they have on the step-by-step -step to get the approval on PPE. So I would strongly recommend that, uh, that Margaret can, can share that report because it gives you all those uh, the documentations that you need to get. Um, yeah, Michelle is correct. Uh, nevertheless, there is another line item just for, uh, for exporters, for factories, rather than local uh, merchandise uh, companies, which has a lower fees. Uh, uh, and then uh, there's so many regulations there uh, that need to be followed. Uh, and I would strongly recommend to, to, to have access to that step-by-step uh, that also is in the in the customs and border patrol uh, website that I shared. But yes, we we have put together some uh, good valuable information just for for the purposes of informing the factories on what to do if they want to export to the U.S. and compliant with with the regulations. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you, um, Jonathan Chifalu. If I if you could ask your question directly to the panelists, Eva, could you please unmute Jonathan Chifalu? Jonathan, go ahead. Okay, my question was, um, uh, what are the uh, challenges that uh, have, uh, or what are the challenges that East African companies face and stopping them from being in the top 10 list of those countries that were certified? Um, thank you, Jonathan. And meeting standards, yes, thank you. Thank you. Avedis? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Jonathan. That, that's a great question. Um, the economic sort of simple answer is just straight volume. Those top 10 weren't the best 10 countries. They were simply the largest 10 countries. Uh, so it is, it is a, a matter of, you know, economic realities that they they export more to uh, uh, more apparel to the world than Africa uh, and the African countries do. But your underlying question is a good one. What will it take for African countries to be uh, the best countries from a quality point of view in terms of being certified and, and, and being socially responsible? And in that regard, I think, um, you know, the, the truth is that uh, the learning curve is a little bit different. Uh, you know, the industry emerged in other parts of the world as far as exporting to the West goes. And so um, Latin America, obviously Asia, especially Southeast Asia, are a bit ahead of the curve uh, with regards to experience. Um, it isn't a big advantage in the sense, but it is contextually speaking uh, relevant because the, the compliance space itself has only been around for just about two and a half decades, as I said. So a 10 year head start is, you know, about half the time that the whole thing's been uh, in place. So that is 
uh, in that sense relevant. So what will it take, right? I think uh, it's wonderful to see events like this uh, being organized to give uh, the, the industry in Africa greater awareness, uh, access to resources, the ability to engage with organizations like RAP and others who can be helpful to them. Uh, that learning curve will happen. I think uh, the, the thing that you have to do as an industry and as, as, as manufacturers, as owners of factories, is understand the, the thinking. You know, one of the reasons why Asia and other places are ahead is because they have invested in this over time. At first, they were also treating it essentially as a siloed, separate consideration, but have emerged now to where they see it as being part and parcel of management planning, production planning. You've talked about how do we make sure we get the fabric right? How do we make sure we you know, get all these other things that, that are part of the product delivery uh, competitiveness matrix? Start thinking about compliance in that sense, same sense as well. Think of it as an investment not as a cost. That's the, the real mental shift that needs to happen. Uh, factories that see compliance as a cost, anything you see as a cost, all you're ever going to want to do is minimize the cost. Whereas if you see something as an investment, you realize that there is going to be some expenditure, but there's going to be a return as well. And that return is worth the expenditure. So start envisioning compliance, thinking about compliance the same way as you would envision whether or not you're going to buy a, a better machine or better processes or invest in uh, a retooling along the lines that Michelle described. So those mental adjustments are what you will need to become the top 10 from a, from a quality perspective of compliance. And hopefully that'll make you more and more competitive. So volumes will rise to when you will enter the list simply on terms of export volume in the world as well. But thank you for that question, Jonathan. Thank you, Louis. Um, Charity, Charity Mwangi, please ask, go ahead and ask your question. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Well, good evening and good morning to um, the people in the US. My name is Charity. Um, I work uh, for a factory called Mboyetu. We are uh, quite new. We are just setting up our processes and making sure, and part of setting up is making sure that we are compliant and we are adhering to industry standards and best practices. So I wanted to know, is there a standard procedure that we should follow, especially in the wake of COVID-19, to make sure that um, our customers' products are sanitary and safe, as well as um, our workers and staff? And thank you for all your contributions and the um, important work you're all doing. Thank you. Who's going to take yeah. I could start to answer. So for a lot of the different levels of PPE production, you'll have to prove that you have what they call good manufacturing practices, which is generally pretty easy to prove that you're cleaning on a regular basis. Um, there's a few points on the, the FDA site that can help you with those good manufacturing practices if you want to Google it. And then if you want to really achieve the higher levels of PPE, of course, you know, eventually it works to having a true clean room and such. But essentially for most items, you do just need to prove that you have those good manufacturing practices. All right. And, and a follow-up question to that would be from uh, Wesley Micah, who's asking, who's actually saying that they are a health startup in Kenya, uh, but pivoted to produce masks and face shields. So he wants to know whether the U.S. market might be interested in their 3D printed masks. Yeah. Anyone with a view on that? It's Andrew? interesting, yeah. <laughs> Michelle, go ahead. Sure. Um, we, we haven't had any 3D mask providers actually come up at a price point that would be, you know, a, a, viable in the US. So it would be interesting to know what that price point is. Um, most of the masks you see are just the cut plastic with the foam, of course, and they're disposable. So if you're able to achieve a, a good price point for those 3D printed masks, that'd be great. Okay, great. Uh, and Andres, you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, at this given point, 
all all products are are, are worth to take a look and and the key factor is uh, how do you present those to the buyers how you are in the front door of the buyer and and that's what our project is is attempting to do is link the factories with the proper uh, buyer the decision makers so they can present what they have uh, and not only uh, it's a product uh, behind it, uh, like uh, all the speakers have mentioned, it's what's behind the product. Uh, this industry is not only about products, it's about service. And that's uh, something that has to be behind the companies uh, on, on the co three concepts I mentioned, the service of transparency, the service of collaborative sourcing, like this new product uh, on the PP, uh, and the service of, of uh, quick responses and speed to market. So at this point, yeah, I do I do see there's opportunities for, for these kind of products in, in this market. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have Vinay Kumar. Vinay, could you please unmute your mic and ask your question? Hi, everybody. Go ahead. Uh, the, uh, we are a vertical textile mill known as Southern Range in Uganda. We are a fully vertical textile mill and for last couple of years we have been trying to enter the US market. And the challenge what we see always is we are an unknown country. A lot of people don't know about Uganda. So it becomes very difficult. They like the product, they like the uh, technologies that we have. But then it becomes Uganda, ah, now what do I do? So how do we get out of this psychological thing? That is what I wanted to ask Andreas about it. Because it's, a, it's purely a psychological barrier. They have a landlocked country, a very small country, not on a global map. Yeah, I think Andreas can take that. And uh, Margaret, feel free to add on to that as well. Andreas, go ahead. Yeah, when I see a fabric producer in, in the region, I get so excited. So uh, awesome to have that question because, uh, again, Uganda has the gold in their hands. It has the cotton, you know, that's gold in this uh, industry. So uh, I don't think it's, it's a mental barrier here from the buyers. I think it's more of the exposure of, of showcasing your operations. Uh, and you can, you can start. If I was you, I would start offering your, your product to the uh, regional apparel producers. Just like Tanzania has exposed her vertical operation and starting to sell the fabric to, to, to large uh, companies uh, that are producing for the US market, but they are located in Ethiopia, they are located in Kenya. So uh, first step, connect with those factories, a regional value chain. Moreover, if you can get all these certifications, laboratory independent certification the qualities on your fabric in terms of uh, of dyes of uh, of shrinkage of naps on uh, of bursting and so on and so forth in order to be under what is called the american standard uh, textile um, specification msda then you have a letter of presentation of your fabric if you can achieve that and your fabric has already those specifications under standards you have the best opportunity in, in this market because you are reducing the transit time from getting fabric from Asia. That's big, that's huge. Yet, how do you expose yourself? How do you get those certifications? How do you present number one with the local producers? Next door, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya, even Mauritius and Madagascar that are desperate looking for, for, or, for fabric. So there's a lot to be done there. Uh, and I think if you already have that experience, uh, I was in Uganda uh, for a long time uh, last year doing the CTA, and, and we uh, advised the government to give full support to, to these endeavors. And, and moreover, ideally, if Uganda can implement a model of doing uh, on top of, of having the gold in their hands, which is the cotton, uh, also implementing uh, similar models like in Ethiopia, giving industrial parks, and the infrastructure to have a, an international buyer establishing in the area and, and produce CMT with the support of having um, integrated factories uh, in, in the supply chain, that would be a big hit. That has tremendous opportunities. And um, moreover, in this post-pandemic uh, era and the resilience process, the buyers are looking to that. They want to remove 
the, the dependency of Far East materials. So again, if, if you have that already in place, I think your marketing needs to be more aggressive to reach out those partners and, and, and stakeholders for your, uh, for your operations. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret, is there any further support that can be provided to uh, the hub for um, you know, a textile producer such as uh, BJ, Binay? Hello, Margaret? Okay, I think you have lost her there. Actually, um, while we're waiting on Margaret, let me make a quick comment here to, to emphasize a point Andres said. It really is about marketing. Uh, and, and, and leading with what you really have to offer. If you get all those certificates, you know, you get a RAP certificate to show social compliance, all the other certificates that Andrew said, believe me, you talk to a US buyer and you tell them, I have a RAP certified and other certificates facility vertical supplier in a country with duty-free access to the US market, they're going to be interested. Then you say, we happen to be in Uganda. That is a secondary point. Don't lead with that because they don't know where Uganda is. I, I, I hear you, Vinay. But tell them that story. We are certified. We are vertically in integrated. We have duty-free access. Are you interested? Yes, very interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an excellent submission, Avedis. Thank you for that. Uh, Margaret, I, I just uh, posed a, a follow-on for you. Is, is there anything that the hub can do to support uh, someone like Vinay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for those who don't know Southern Range Nyanza, for those who are older, there used to be a, a family. They used to be a school. Um, Margaret, Margaret, there seems to be a problem with your connection. Um, perhaps what you can do is just turn off video and use audio for now. Just turn off your video and use audio. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Um, Southern Range Nyanza, most people don't recognize the name and Nyanza, but for most East Africans, they'll remember Ginger. So that's. Um, Margaret, okay, we seem to have lost Margaret. I think she's having a problem with her connection. Um, let me move on. There's a question here from Grace Angela um, Kirabo, who's asking, can SMEs be funded too? And this is direct to um, our money man, money man on the panel, Roger. <laughs> Do you look at S SMEs as well? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's really um, any enterprise that, that is operating uh, in East Africa. Uh, they can be small to medium sized businesses. We've we, in our pipeline, uh, we have companies that range looking for uh, financing all the way down to $5,000 up to 30 million. So it's really any size company. Um, what we're really trying to do is help we make, make sure that we get some capital mobilized. That's really the key here. Thank all right, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, Honorable Moses Curia, who's asking how can East African producers approach market acquisition from a more structured, united and collaborative framework as opposed to everyone for themselves. And if that was to happen, who is our matching partner from buyers organizations? It sounds like something that is right up your alley, Andres. Yeah, I mean, at this point, there is no a monopoly of the market. There's no organization that, that holds the buyers itself. This is more a one-to-one -one marketing strategy for each one of the firms. Uh, if you have a company that has something to offer in terms of speed to market, transparency, collaborative sourcing, you have a good product, uh, by all means, uh, they have, will we'll, we'll take a look on your profile, will we'll send a, a survey on what are your capabilities in terms of uh, quantities, uh, AQL systems, and lead times on your production, uh, and then we'll be, we'll be happy to, to, to put that in, in, into our efforts to find a, a buyer, a trade linkage service. So uh, there is opportunities for all kinds of, of, of firms. There are buyers, yeah, they will buy uh, two containers per month, but there's also a smaller buyer that wants to buy half of a container, you know, a more tailor-made uh, product. 
the, the, quest, the, the key questions here is are, are the factories able to, to communicate with buyers properly? Are the, are the factories able to manage those relationships in terms of uh, giving the service of uh, providing samples, providing quotes, and the fabric structures, and then there will be definitely uh, a player because uh, as, as mentioned in my presentation, the uh, buyers are looking at this point for alternative sourcing partners all over the world. So there is no such of, you know, a, a union or a, an areas or association just dedicated to, 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 to buyers. It's, it's just an open market for this. Okay. And that's what the trade hub provides as part of our activities. Okay, all right, great. Um, Margaret, perhaps you want to add something to that? I think uh, we are already engaged with uh, Nguo Yetu, and uh, I think we'll be able to advance that discussion uh, with them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Getting on to the uh, linking with buyers. Yeah. And just to answer now that my network is back, just to answer Vinay's question. Yes, uh, we all know Nitro Ginger, especially those of us who are much older. Uh, you have a fantastic product. You went to Magic. I remember I was with you in February 2017. You need to keep going. You need to keep sending the message. But as uh, Anne uh, said, uh, start with the original uh, customers, show what you're able to do, get into the value chain, and then look at also your product design for your finished products. Uh, I think you had some fantastic uh, children's clothing, which I think would do well. So you have the right uh, package. I think you just need to be uh, focused on advancing it uh, year after year. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, it's, it's interesting how time just flies when you're having a really valuable conversation such as the one we're having uh, this morning, this afternoon. Um, we only have two minutes on the clock. Um, I want to invite our panelists to give their last or their closing comments. Uh, but before we do that, I think this would be a great time to, for the audience to just take a quick poll uh, that is coming up on your screen right now. The only two questions. This is an anonymized poll. Um, we will not be able to uh, see who has answered what. So we urge you to uh, give us your answers. It will only take you all of 30 seconds. Um, yeah, so please just go ahead, go ahead and then fill in your, your responses. This will help us with shaping up um, this conversation and next time we have it. So please urge you, we are now at 17% of you have voted, appalled. I'd like you to get to at least 60 before we close it. We had 41%. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. 10 more seconds, we'll close it at one minute. All right, so that's one minute. Um, and as you can see, the results have been displayed there. There are just two questions. 85% um, of you find this forum very useful. 15% uh, find it moderately useful, which is great. That's a good, a good score. And uh, <clears throat> um, in terms of information um, that you'd like to pursue further, there's 54% who'd like to get more information on the apparel market in the US um, and uh, financing for apparel is the next big one at 35%, and the technology solutions are 12%. So this is great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I'm now going to invite our panelists, starting with uh, Michelle, to just share your closing remarks as, uh, as we wind up. Great. Yeah, it's been exciting to be part of this, and I hope that everyone can consider Gerber technology as they move forward. There's unique financing opportunities, as everyone spoke about, and partnering with Gerber for software and hardware can actually enable you to do PPE and apparel and kind of flex your business back and forth, and we can help you on that PPE journey. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'll go to Roger. Great, thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure to uh, join you all today. I think the, the last closing comments are, are best really served in terms of making sure that companies uh, take and pay attention to the basics. You know, if you're going to look for increasing uh, your capital, 
uh, think about it from a standpoint of what is it that you need to do? How do you need to prepare your company in such a way that you can entice an investor in? How can you get them, uh, present material to them in such a way that they're going to want to say yes? You're going to want to have transparent uh, financial records. You want, you're going to want to have a good business plan. You're going to want to have demonstrated demonstration of market history. Uh, you know, the, some of the very obvious things. And so it's really important to make sure that you put your best foot forward and take time to invest in that uh, proposal that you're going to uh, uh, shop with a prospective lender. That's where we've seen the most success is those companies who pay attention to those details. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, Vedis, I know there's, there's several open questions that have been addressed to you. And I just want to reassure the audience that uh, we will share the answers to those questions. Um, we didn't get enough time to go through each and every one of them. I'm sure Avedis will be more than happy to send us uh, written submissions on the questions that we'll share with you. So Avedis, your, your last words. Thank you, Maxwell. And yes, I certainly will be. And it's a great sign to me that there are so many questions coming uh, because my sort of conclusion remarks to wrap things up, no pun intended, is really to emphasize the point I made in the presentation, right? Social compliance is no longer an afterthought. It's no longer a side thing. It's no longer a luxury. It is part and parcel of the business decision-making process for all buyers, and it should be part and parcel for your decision-making process as a manufacturer. Think of it as an investment, get into the nitty gritty, become uh, uh, accustomed to treating it the same way you treat any other production related issue from a systemic management day-to-day -day approach uh, and you will be in, in, in a good place. There is great potential in, in East Africa. Uh, you need to compete and, and it is important to be able to validate these practices independently. That is of course where RAP can help as the biggest and if I say so myself, the best program out there. Uh, it is important that you take it seriously, have that independent verification and use that as a competitive, uh, uh, distinguishing competitive marker for you from the rest of the space. Um, and to, to be able to fulfill that potential. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the, uh, those additional questions and anybody should feel free to reach out to me directly via email and I'll be happy to address any further questions you might have. And thank you to my fellow panelists. This was a great and enjoyable experience. Like you said, Maxwell, the time just flew. Uh, really appreciated it. And thank you to everybody for, for the attention. Have a thank you. Afternoon. All right, Andres, your closing remarks. I've been working with Africa, I'm going to my fourth year, and I am really, every time I'm more impressed of what the region can offer. I called the region as the sleeping diamond in the apparel industry. You gotta wake up. A uh, couple of weeks ago, I was attending the American Association of Footwear and Apparel, and I note how many times the word Africa came into the, uh, into the conference. The, that was about 150 leaders of the industry. It was mentioned 12 times during the conference. A three hour conference, 12 times the word Africa was in discussion. Trade war with China still being strong. The pandemic is being blamed to China. There's already a sentiment against using China products. Companies are moving out of China and Africa is in its best position. So what's missing? My message to the audience, believe in yourself. You have everything that it takes. You have the labor, you have the skill sets, even you have the raw materials. What are you lacking of? Investment, entrepreneurship, and believing yourself. I believe in you. I believe you can do it. When I see the statistics that Margaret showed today and see over 770 million exports in Apple, that is humongous, that is huge. Africa reminds me Bangladesh 15 years ago, but you have something that Bangladesh didn't have. You have Goa and you have the momentum the trade wars in this time, working on your behalf and your benefit, take advantage of this window time. It's not going to be a big window time. It's just historical window time. And this is the time to capture this market. Good luck to you all. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Maxwell, for an impeccable organization and, and, and leading us to this great conclusion. Thank you so much, Maxwell. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. We really appreciate your input. And thanks for that inspiration. Um, definitely, I think that the challenge is out there. It's for the companies to rise up and we'll do our part uh, together with partners, great partners such as yourselves to make sure that we're able to take advantage of this opportunity. So I want to give the final opportunity to um, our host, Margaret, 
to uh, share closing remarks. Margaret, go ahead. Thank you, Maxwell. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, everyone. Um, this has been a great exchange, and I think the objectives I listed at the beginning have been achieved. Uh, I'd like to challenge the enterprises. A lot of you received a request to do mapping. Uh, if you haven't sent your mapping profile, please send it to us. It's the basic document we use to start working with a company. We can't work with you unless we know you. And unlike before Andres used to travel around East Africa, he can't do that now. So at least give us the raw material in terms of information and we'll try our level best to involve you in our activities. Secondly, right now we are at Magic Show. It's a virtual edition of Magic. We started on the 15th of September and will be on until December the 15th. For those companies who have been matched and have engaged with Andres, we'll be willing to start promoting you on that platform uh, once we have your basic information. So please get through the mapping process, then we can move on from there. Lastly, just to mention that in addition to Naima and I, we also have uh, uh, consultants who have been retained in, uh, in uh, uh, four countries. We have Jonathan Chifalu in Kenya. We have Veronica Shao Mohead in Tanzania. We have Andrew Kagwa Luze in Uganda. And very recently, Jean-Baptiste Hatagekimana in Rwanda. Despite the fact that Rwanda is not uh, exporting apparel under Goa, we have other sectors like specialty foods and footwear. And we will be doing these similar activities in the other sectors, but I think apparel is the leader, is the champion, and uh, we believe that 700 plus million should go up to uh, close to 900 by the end of next year. So we'll work together to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, I think all that's left for me, um, it's been an honor. I want to really, really thank the panelists, Michelle, Avedis, Andres, Roger, and a big, big thank you to um, Margaret and the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub for really getting us together and having this very stimulating conversation. For me, it's been, it's been quite edifying. You know, things that, uh, you know, some of us have not really paid much attention to before, but now we've had an opportunity to, to, to get insights and be edified on what actually this space is about and the opportunities that are there. And I'm sure that our companies will be able to rise up to take up and step up to the challenge that has been put out there. So a very big thank you to all of you, our audience, for participating and for making time to attend. Please don't forget to join us on Friday. We have the second part of this uh, two-part webinar series where we'll be having a discussion. It's actually more of a panel discussion um, where there'll be panelists sharing various experiences of what they've done. And we'll be honored again to have Andres with us sharing his uh, valuable um, experience in this space. So that will be Friday, uh, September 25th at the same time. So that would be 8 a.m. Um, EST and 3 p.m. East Africa time. Um, for those who have not registered for that particular forum, um, a link has been posted in the chat box. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's there. Link has been posted by Eva on the chat box, so please do use that link to be able to register and attend the forum. And with that, I want to say thank you once more. It's been a wonderful engagement, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the day, for those who are in the US, and for those who are here in East Africa, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, goodbye, and we've come to the end of our webinar. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, bye-bye. Well done, thanks Maxwell.